And now, the survival show that once survived, Flying United. Just barely. In this episode, we discuss skills for survival. This is a back-to-basics episode for those who are new to preparedness and to prod those of us who've been around for a while to get off our butt and do something. We'll cover six key skill areas every prepper should have locked down. Howdy and welcome to In the Rabbit Hole's Urban Survival Podcast. This is episode number 213. I'm your host, Aaron, and you are in the rabbit hole. Safe and sound. There's a topic that keeps coming up more and more with the industry professionals that I have as friends. Um, These happen in in private and in, in some of the group conversations, and it's something we've discussed on this show many times, but today I want to dedicate it to uh, one episode to it, and I'm doing this to kind of kick those of us in the ass that have been in this for a while, and uh, and I include myself in that conversation, uh, but also just something for new preppers coming in, because this is, uh, as I've said in the last few Back to Basics episodes, this is something that is very easy for shows to get away from. We get into the the big neg- nebulous topics, and we leave the basic stuff behind, and people have to sift and sort through all the episodes. And I think with the rabbit hole, now we're up to 213 episodes. And that's a lot to go back through. And so I just kind of want to reshape this and rethink about it and give out some of my thoughts on the things that we should be focusing on more. And, and, as, a, and as a general rule, the thing that keeps coming up in these conversations I have is that as a group, we really ought to be spending a much greater percentage of our prepper dollars on training and instruction rather than growing our piles of prepper shit. And that is to say that in general, we should be spending less of our money on buying more guns or more knives or more things and instead getting out there and learning either how to use what we've got or learning how to do more with less things. And that really should be uh, a, a big goal of every prepper, is learning to do more things with less stuff. So to start off with, let's get into outdoor skills, because I think outdoor skills are this this area that a lot of preppers really get into. And you could even say that these skills, outdoorsy type skills, are things that in some way differentiate preppers from survivalists. Survivalists, at least survivalists, the the Soldier of Fortune magazine survivalists of the 70s and 80s that, ah, I'm going to go naked into the woods and come back in three days wearing a buckskin and riding a horse and uh, whatever other uh, things that were going to go along with that. And that's that's great if you're Tom Brown or um, Ron Hood or if you want to be one of those people. I would in no way put that down. I love that kind of stuff personally. But the reality is, mm, of all the things that are going to go wrong in our life, getting stuck somewhere in the woods and needing to live off the land uh, is not one of those high-ticket items. However, that is not to say that I don't think you should do it. I think you should. But I I think it just gets too much play. As an urban prepper, or just as a prepper in general, do you really need, need to know like 13 ninja ways of making a fire? I mean, do you need to know how to do a hand drill, a bow drill, a pump drill, a fire plow, a flint and steel, a fire piston, a ferro rod, or a ferro rod and magnesium, making a fire out of bag of urine, uh, one of those silly things, arcing a battery, and then that using steel wool and a 9-volt battery, and mixing potassium permanganate, and just about anything, actually, <laughs> but traditionally with glycerin. You know, I mean, these are cool, but I think really, uh, for the most part, what people need is like one or two two, maybe three good ways of making a fire. And I think if you understand the basics of making a friction fire, by and large, you kind of got it. Um, but really, just being able to build a proper fire bundle or build a proper fire, period, goes a long way towards that. And, and to tell a bit of a story here and to kind of go back in time, I know I had a lot of experience with it growing up. I was I was an outdoorsy kid. I did a lot of camping and things like that. And I loved stuff like that. 
But, you know, as a city kid, so, and, and as an adult, and this happens to most people, really, that you know, even if you did grow up in that, you have a tendency to kind of get away from it in your, your 20s when you're trying to, and even your 30s when you're trying to make your way in the world. And when we came back to it, it was, it was difficult to really find anybody teaching those skills. It, it ended up becoming a real team effort as a group, a small group of, uh, it was Jonathan and I and a few other people trying to relearn these skills and acquire new skills. And it required a lot of, of hunting around. And so I think one of the great ways to start getting into outdoor skills, as crazy as, as this is going to sound, is if you're in an area that has a good outdoor store. Uh, REI tends to be better than most. Uh, there are better stores. Uh, they tend to be small regional stores like Going Gear. But if you stop in and find somebody knowledgeable there, you're bound to start finding people who will actually teach these skills. And that was the problem we ran, ran into. There, there was really kind of two people, two kinds of people in this world. There were there was the the professional outdoorsman who would teach these skills. However, they were very hard to find, and they tended to not be good at building a website and getting into search engines and just generally making it easy to find them. One skill in particular took us several years to track down, and it was in the oddest of places. I'll tell that story in a moment. But what we did find was that going into an REI, A, they had classes, and B, it was usually the the older guy that worked there. When I say older guy, I'm saying it, someone in their, their 40s or up that had been camping most of their life. They tended to be uh, a little more talkative. They tended to be somebody who was really interested in the topic, and they tended to know other people who were into this. And to back up for a second, because I kind of skipped a, a, an answer here, the answer is there's two kinds of people. There's the guy who does it professionally who's not good at being found, and there's the guy who doesn't do it professionally but is really good at it. And has a lot to teach. And he teaches people. And maybe he teaches scout troops and stuff. But he doesn't do it professionally. So he's not going to go build a website. He's not going to be found. But he is going to make trips into REI. He's going to have a tendency to... to Or she. I, I don't want to come across as sexist here. They're going to have a tendency to talk to and go and frequent these stores. And the staff there are going to know who they are. And so if you just ask around a little bit you will get some leads on some people, and uh, most likely. Uh, one of the ones that that uh, a guest we've had on the show who also has a book, Dr. Mark Vorderbruggen, who is an awesome human being, and I, I like him a lot, uh, but it took us a long time to find him because it, back then he had no real professional ties to this kind of stuff. And oddly, he could actually teach a tremendous amount more skills than just the wild edible stuff. But that's what he's locally famous for, and now he has a book and everything, as I said. And it took a long time of searching. We ended up finding him through asking around a lot, and then we got a lead that, oh, he's over at the Arboretum. And it turned out that Mark was teaching these wild edible classes there, but he was doing it infrequently because at the time, not again, these are, these are not organizations or people that have a lot of uh, time or experience with promoting things. So there weren't a lot of people aware of the classes, so a lot of people weren't showing up to the classes, so they weren't scheduling these classes very often. So we had to track down, or I had to track down the person uh, that was in charge of it at the Arboretum and then get through to Mark, and then they basically said, if you can get, and I think it was like 20 people to sign up for this class, then we'll put it on. No problem. I, I can do that. So I went out and promoted it. And and that one class that we took, I don't know necessarily what happened after that, but they did go on and the class, the word started getting out and the classes started getting more popular. But that story aside, this is the nature of most of these things. So going back to it, whether it's REI or you know, just a good outdoor store in your area, you would also be wise to any of these people to kind of look up their credentials or to just... Maybe do a few Google searches once you figure out who they are to make sure that they are somebody who hasn't, I don't know, like killed a whole bunch of people uh, doing stupid stuff outdoors. But in general, if somebody in an outdoor store is recommending them, you should probably be pretty safe. There are some other great places where you can find out about this stuff or organizations that bring these kinds of people in. Uh, Apple Project Appleseed, which we'll talk about in a little bit. 
there are a lot of people in the survival and preparedness that have skills to teach that have a tendency to show up in the Project Appleseed program. And so if you go get involved in that, you can then start start to find some of these other people to teach you outdoor skills and don't take it for granted that because you were in scouts for all of a hot minute when you were a kid or even for a long time that you have any clue of what you're doing. And so there is civil air patrol is another great place where you can go and they bring in resources and have their own network of resources to learn these sorts of things. And so within this, I would say the skills that someone should start focusing on are backpacking and basic camping skills, find somebody to teach you to make a fire. If you can nail down those three things, your outdoor skills are pretty much covered. Most likely in the backpacking course, you're going to find somebody to also teach you how to signal a plane and and uh, and and signal for help in general, and that's kind of the hidden thing that gets thrown in there. Uh, and again, like this is one of the reasons I really like REI. I, I like the store in general, at least the local one, because Marshall does not have a going gear here near me. But they're a great store, and they they are smart in that they put on a lot of classes, which does cool things in the outdoorsy community. But it also uh, gets people to come into their store and hopefully buy stuff for them. So they're able to offer these courses for, for most of them for free. So again, you want backpacking and you want camping. Those are your core things. And if you can find somebody to teach you make a fire, go forth and prosper. And now for a quick break. Listeners, do you get at least $3 a month worth of value out of ITRH? We'd love to give you more. Visit ITRH.net to find out about membership benefits. For starters, members get access to every episode ever produced and a monthly virtual conference. That's just for starters. And it's important to know, In the Rabbit Hole is supported nearly entirely by Roving Horde Armada members just like you. That's how we pay the bills, stay on the air, keep the lights on around here. So go to ITRH.net to learn how you can become part of the ITRH Roving Horde Armada. Next up, subscribe to the show through your favorite podcast app to make sure you never miss an episode by going to intherabbithole.com slash iTunes or intherabbithole.com slash Stitcher or intherabbithole.com slash iHeartRadio or intherabbithole.com slash Google Play. Or if you are one of those weirdos who listen to the show through YouTube, you can go to intherabbithole.com slash YouTube because you know what? We support weirdos. However weird you want to be, we're all about that. Now, back to the show. The next thing I would say, and this is a big one that I harp harp on a lot and I need to kick myself in the ass about, which is medical. I have let my uh, first aid stuff kind of go by the wayside and it's something I'm it's something I'm trying to carve out the time to renew, which is first aid, CPR, and I believe it's AED, the defibrillator units. And right across recently kind of doubled the prices on those classes. So I don't know. I don't know what that's all about. I'm kind of, I'm personally still investigating that. But I would say whether it's Red Cross or anything else, if you have, if all you have is a day and all you have is, is a limited amount of money, I would say that is where you should get, or or that is where you should start with any kind of medical stuff. Is get that first aid, that CPR, and learn how to use a defibrillator unit. Uh, don't put them on your head; it's it's not for that. Um, <laughs> the other thing, it was funny. I was speaking to Ron Davis, who is a very very good friend of mine, and uh, also is my business partner in another company. He's been on the show a number of times. He's the former host of uh, EMS Newbie, as he went through uh, EMS and. And then on through paramedic school and became a paramedic uh, <laughs> as a side hobby, and that was his survival skill. We were we were talking through this uh, this show earlier, and what I was going to do in this episode earlier, and, and we started talking about it, and, and it was like, tell me about EMT Basic again. And so EMT Basic, if you want to go that next step, or if you want to skip that first step of just learning the basic, here's how to keep somebody alive long enough for somebody uh, in a uniform to show up and take them away then EMT Basic uh, is really great. I think he said it was like six weeks long. It's usually taught through community colleges. It's not very expensive, but definitely something to look into. And that is going to give you a lot, a lot more 
than just your basic first aid class. He also brought up that wilderness EMT courses, like wilderness EMT basic, would be a really excellent excellent road for anyone interested in preparedness and interested in gaining medical skills. Now, EM, wilderness EMT basic is going to be the same thing, but the difference with wilderness EMT is – the idea is that you are, by and large, you're not going to have all of these contraptions, doodads, and whatchamid gizzets with you as you would expect to have in the, e- or would be presumed to have in the EMT basic class. So you're at and you got two sticks and somebody who needs help uh, is basically where they start. And you also have a much longer amount of time that you need to get somebody stable and then keep them stable so that you can get them to help. So wilderness EMT, if you wanted to go even beyond that. Uh, I I would say that they all play off one another and that they would all be good and there's no reason except except skipping the very basic first aid to go to EMT basic. Uh, you would be pretty well served if you went to both e- EMT basic and wilderness EMT basic. The trouble a lot of people run into, I myself ran into this, was finding a wilderness EMT basic course in my area that now that may have changed over the last few years i haven't looked recently but when i looked which was probably about now that i think about it probably about eight or nine years ago there was nothing in my nothing readily available in my area so i didn't do it a few google searches you're bound to find it in your area if you can't find it through a few google searches again go through the emt basic and whoever teaches the emt basic course is bound to know how you can get Wilderness EMT Basic or who to contact to find out more about that. Those guys hang out together. Just saying. The next really great resource for getting preparedness-related skills is CERT, Community Emergency Response Team. I need to, I need to point this out because a lot of people look at CERT and they think uh, that they are going to become some sort of post-apocalyptic action hero uh, when they go through the eight-week or maybe 12-week course. I think it's yeah eight-week course for CERT. That is not what's going to happen. You are going to get, it's sort of a world survey of all the most basic skills for the most likely large-scale catastrophes to happen to you or around you or whatever. CERT tends to be funny. It is how organized they are and whether or not it's offered, even though it is a, uh, a federal, federally funded program, which also means it's free to you, or not necessarily free, you've already paid for it, you're just, you know, don't have to pay for it again. Some are better than others. Some areas are better than others. Some areas don't have it at all. Some areas are disorganized. Some areas are extremely organized. Um, they are, again, a government agency. And I know they've gotten crossways with me a few times and now just totally give me the cold shoulder uh, because I actually point out that it is a basic survey to people and somehow they take that as a negative criticism. It's not a negative criticism. It's managing expectations. I know because I've myself had those expectations and I met a lot of ever, actually almost every other person I've ever met that finds CERT right before they go into it, they think they're going to be an action hero when they come out. And it's like, no, that's not what this is. This is just enough to make you really helpful in a disaster situation, as opposed to another person just sucking off resources uh, in a situation. So I support CERT. I think CERT is great. I think people should go take part of it. Just be aware that it, it, it you are not going to be Jason Bourne when you're done with it. That That's what that is. It is it is a government program. Take it with why that is. And the next government program, which I mentioned earlier, which is a wonderful program, and that is Civil Air Patrol. Uh, we did an entire episode on Civil Air Patrol. It wasn't that long ago, and you can go to the site. Uh, I will link to it in the link to that episode in this episode today. That is a there is a tremendous amount of volunteering uh, opportunities there, and in those volunteering opportunities are the opportunities to get instruction and training in those areas and to meet other people who are most likely 
going to be preparedness minded and going to have a lot of leads on other skills you should be acquiring and most likely in inexpensive ways uh, or, or inexpensive ways of acquiring that, that information. The next one would be communication and communication always comes back to ham. There's two kinds of people in this world, people who love ham and people who hate ham. I'm probably the third kind of person, which is I don't hate ham. I just don't want to do it, even though I am licensed in ham. You you really just either it's your it's your jam or it's not. I do it and I'm desperately trying to get better at it and get more involved in it so that I learn it. But it's just it's not my thing. I don't enjoy it. And and that's really kind of the two kinds of people there are in the world. However, I would say that through all my travels, I have never found anything that is as reliable a means of acquiring news and information or communicating with other people in a disaster situation. There's just, there's nothing else like it. And you really would be remiss if you didn't get into it. The next one, everybody's favorite, guns. So... Guns are a tricky thing, uh, but I think there is a, a, everybody wants to just go buy a gun from the gun store and then go to a range and, and well, damn it, I'm a manly man, I'll figure it out if nobody ever taught me. And the likelihood is that even if, if somebody did teach you, most likely they taught you wrong, unless they are themselves a, a personal firearms instructor uh, of some kind. So where do you start with that? And this was the the trouble, again, that... Uh, Jonathan and Jason and I, we all ran into was where do you begin with this stuff? I would tell somebody to start off with, just go to an NRA's hunter safety course there. It's not riveting. It's not exciting. It, it, but it is important, good, solid, well-grounded information. Um, by and large, the really great people that teach it, it's, it's, they're usually very inexpensive to uh, attend. Not usually. They are very inexpensive to attend. It again, it's basic stuff. So don't walk in there thinking you're going to be, you know, super soldier when you walk out. It's just, this is basic stuff that you need to know before you go forward. Even if you went hunting with whoever, when you were a kid, just go do it. The next thing of course is my favorite project Appleseed. I love project Appleseed. The caveat to this is you will not walk away from Project Appleseed as some high-speed, low-drag operator operating optimally, operationally. Uh, it is a traditional rifle marksmanship program with a good dose of history. And seriously, I I can't imagine anyone who couldn't afford to go to an app, Appleseed shoot. You can go for one day. You can go for two days. You can mix things up like I did and totally screw up and go to the seven day thing when you shouldn't be going to the seven day thing, but you can do it. People just will be like, well, I don't think you're in the right place. So anyway, Apple seed will give you those foundational rifle skills that are applicable no matter what you're doing. And if anyone was going to ask me, oh, should I go take this course from, from whoever? And, and, and I'm going to do like, woo, flips in the air with my, right. no doesn't matter what kind of rifle you intend to go forward using, go to an apple seed, learn the fundamentals, and then go on to the tactical stuff. You will learn that there are some differences between traditional marksmanship and tactical shooting. There's the positions are slightly different. Movements are slightly different. It doesn't matter what you, it, it, it all becomes, will come super easy to you. To go to project apple seed first. I um, love those guys, love everything they do. I myself am as most likely I have a lot of stuff going on this summer and I have a lot of stuff going on in the fall, but in the late fall, I intend to start really getting back into Project Appleseed. Um, most likely not as an instructor, actually not most likely not as an instructor. I will be going just as somebody who likes to shoot. Um, I, th I think I, it's something I really want to do is just go back out there and have fun and go to a bunch of the two day shoots and do that. I would encourage you, the rest of you to do it. I believe last time I checked when I was still looking at those types of things and, and uh, was a uh, instructor in training, I believe the shoots were 75 bucks. I think it also, it varies a little bit from shoot to shoot because they've got a paid range fee. So, but it's always extremely affordable. Like 
There is one other road you can take, and that is it becomes a little more expensive, but it is a very good way of doing it, and there's going to be an extra skill that I'm going to throw in here. And that is to find a local firearms instructor that you like, and that is important. I've taken from instructors I ended up not liking. They've never been on the show, so I don't think it's anybody on the show that's ever been on the show. The point I'm trying to make there is it's important to find instructors you like. So just talk to him a little bit first. Make sure you jive with him. So with personal instruction or even group classes, you, you're going to get more of those tactical skills. That is what's being taught these days. So before you think that finding an instructor is going to be too expensive, go look and go look around. You will most likely find that at the end of the day, it is not that expensive uh, to find an instructor to, to spend an hour with you personally. And a couple of things I would do is just spend an, plan to spend an hour with him on cleaning up the fundamentals of your handgun and your long gun shooting. Of course, if you went to Project Appleseed, you don't really need as much on that with rifles, but more with pistol. There, people have a lot of little bad habits with pistol, and that is not something that there is any kind of free or extremely low-cost course that I'm aware of that is going to clean that up. So I would do that. And then the other thing I would do is... Pay that person for an additional hour where there is no shooting, where where you take them, your basic battery of guns, and ask them to walk you through how to do basic maintenance on those things and how to clean them properly and care for them and love them properly. There's the difference between reading in the manual and actually doing, and sometimes those things are not one and the same, uh, and two Two people can read the same thing very differently. So I would recommend going in and doing that. And that is something I did with uh, someone who's become a, a, a definitely a friend of mine. And he's been on the show a very long time ago. He was, uh, I think, our first, uh, the the first concealed handgun license class that, or, that Jonathan and I went to together. We ended up meeting Dan. And Dan was a uh, retired Secret Service. He was a retired Secret Service tactical trainer, I think, at that time. And so we really locked out. You're not going to find a trainer. You're not always going to be able to find a trainer that's going to be able to train you in everything like he could. Um, But he was a guy who grew up with guns, who loved guns, who loved shooting, who was, I mean, he was a Secret Service tactical trainer. So um, that is one of the things I did. He and I did a bunch of private, private classes together. And we also did at least one, we may have done two sessions where I went to him and said, assume I know nothing. And here is each of my guns. I I would like you to teach me everything I should know and teach me like I'm seven years old. Again, pretend I know nothing. And that is the way I went into it. And it was really great. And I did learn a lot from him in that hour or two we spent together doing that. I think we walked through AR-15s together, how to break them down, how to put them back together, what to look for, basic things to look for that might be going wrong with them, uh, basic things to do for maintenance. And we did the same thing with pistols and shotguns, and it was money extremely well spent. A very important message before we close out today. We are coming up on the summer. That means ITRH will go on summer break starting May 1st. Last episode of this season will be May 1st. ITRH will then return for the next season, August 7th, 2017. If you are new around here, I2H goes on summer break every year in May and returns in August. During the summer, we'll drop a short episode every three to four weeks to keep your appetite wet and keep your feed live. We call these I2H summer shorts. The show is not going away. We're just taking a little summer break to recharge our batteries and work on our own prepper projects. Links and resources from this episode can be found at by going to in the rabbit hole.com slash E213. Support the show. Go to ITRH.net to become part of the ITRH Roving Horde Armada. Again, this show is supported and kept on the air. Microphones hot, lights on, and everything through listeners just like you. Again, go to ITRH.net to become part of the ITRH Roving Horde Armada. With that, we wrap up episode number 213 from the Lone Star State. Till next time, stay safe and sound.